Welcome to Luminosity. Uh, this is the very last day um, of our week-long event that has nearly killed me. Um, it, it's been much more successful than we uh, thought it would be. We've had quite a few thousand people come through the exhibition. Um, and I encourage all of you after tonight's talk to wander around up here, but also to wander around downstairs, particularly to the very end of this building, uh, which is very, very beautiful indeed. Um, Luminosity is largely about us showing Sydney and New South Wales that we are very big and very good. Um, and I hope we've been successful in doing exactly that and putting up a very large exhibition of student work over an extended period of time, you know, talking to the schools, doing this sort of stuff all in one program. And I hope is, in fact, it will, I think, change the image that some people have of New South Wales, of the built environment at New South Wales. Um, so, let's talk about this evening. Um, this evening, uh, the running order will be, well, me talking first of all, and then I'll introduce tonight's guest speaker, uh, Professor John Hunter from the University of Cardiff. Immediately after that, there will be a few questions, and then I'll introduce Bill Randolph, our, um, our ADR, our Associate Dean Research, uh, to chair a panel discussion on urban design. Okay. And since this is the very last event of Luminosity, um, Alexander Sardine will then uh, essentially close the, uh, close the event down for this year. Um, and after that, there'll be some drinks and camps and so on. So let me encourage you yet again to, to wander around, go downstairs, have a look at the student work, have a look at what we've been doing at Built Environments in New South Wales. Okay. Um, let me begin by talking about um, our speaker tonight. Our speaker tonight is Professor John Hunter, uh, who many of you, I think, will know because he's been to Sydney before and has actually written some really important things about urban design and planning in New South Wales and in Sydney. Currently, he's a professor of urban design at Cardiff University in Wales, but he's held a number of positions in a number of different places, including, I'm going to have to read this, I'm afraid, um, he taught urban studies at York University in Toronto. Um, he's been involved in planning and land management and development at Reading University. He is involved in environmental uh, planning at, at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Um, and as I said earlier, his current position is um, as head of urban design at the University of, um, of, of Cardiff. He is a member of the Urban Design Group, a founder member of the Academy of Learned Societies for the Social Sciences, and an honorary friend of the Royal Society of Architects in Wales. He was a director of the Design Commission for Wales and chair of its design review panel from 2002 to 2012. Um, and he has wide ranging interests in urban design and urban planning. Um, and um, he has also written, I think, one of the most interesting things that has ever been written about urban design in Sydney. And I'm just trying to, it was, it, it's, it's an article, but it's the longest article I think most of you would have ever seen. At least 100 and what, 20, 30, or maybe 200 and something pages. Um, and I wrote down the name, I've just forgotten it. I apologize. Anyway, I think we should uh, give a great welcome to, to John Panter. John. Thank you very much, Alan. It's a great pleasure to be uh, in Sydney. Um, I had a sort of one semester sabbatical in Sydney back in 2002, uh, and it was uh, one of the best things I've ever done, really, because I found the city absolutely gripping in terms of its uh, environment. The, its history of planning was even more interesting. Um, I read some great uh, stuff. I had wonderful colleagues who used to knock on my door. James Werrick, who can't be here tonight. Um, John Lang, uh, Sandy Cuthbert. You know, there's two giants of urban design whose you know, books line our shelves and we give to our students to read. So the whole MUD program was a revelation to me. And Rob Freestone gave me the kind of uh, the lowdown on much of the planning. Uh, so it was, a, it was a very, very fruitful time and I had a great time walking the city. So it's, it's wonderful to be back, and it's wonderful to see UNSW, you know, uh, punching its weight, really, when I look around at what's on the walls. 
uh, uh, both upstairs and downstairs. I think it's a tremendous tribute to uh, the school and to those who worked so hard to, to, to achieve this. Uh, this whole exhibition is a great end of year uh, event and I hope it will continue into the future. But I'm here tonight to talk to you about the, um, the English urban renaissance um, between 19, uh, 1999 to 2012 and uh, it's, I've subtitled it The Rise and Demise of Urban, uh, urban Design Quality because I think that's, uh, it's pretty much what happened. And it's not just because the Conservatives have come in in 2010 and uh, wiped out so much of uh, the, the policies and things that uh, the, um, that the Labour, new Labour government had produced, but it's because of the failures within the, system, within the Renaissance itself. So I want to reflect on those. I think they have great importance, not just to the UK or to England, but to uh, the problem of planning and, and urban design generally. So that's what I'll talk about. Um, it was agreed that I talk for an hour, um, so I will try to be as quick and as, uh, uh, so we, as, as speedy as I can uh, to, to do that. So, um, otherwise it's a bit death by PowerPoint, I think. So uh, I'm just warning you in advance, you can leave now, uh, sl silently walk away if you wish. So let's um, kick things off by just looking at the uh, four publications here. Um, this one is the original task force report, Richard Rogers' task force, uh, with many distinguished academics, uh, but particularly professionals on it. And they produced a great tome, uh, which has uh, done the circuit, really, of the, of the world, I would say. And then in 2005, when things were not going particularly well, they wrote towards a strong urban renaissance, um, which was trying to sort of paper over the, not paper over the cracks, to try and find the weaknesses in the system and to restructure it. So in 2009, on the eve of the uh, uh, death of, the, of New Labour, really, we wrote our um, urban design in the British Urban Renaissance, which was a very interesting structure because we asked an academic to write a paper and present a paper. We then asked a professional uh, to criticize it. We then asked the, someone from the local government administration to offer their comments. And finally, we had in the audience uh, a very good bunch of activists. And we did this for the 16 cities uh, in the UK. I'm only going to talk about England tonight, but they gave us so much material, uh, really enough to last a lifetime. So it was a very, it was a very enjoyable um, uh, project to uh, undertake. Um, I'm going to try to focus on just four elements, really. The National Urban Design Policy Framework, which I think is very relevant to Australia, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. The second point, the housing location, quantity, quality, sustainability, because that was the undoing, really, of the Renaissance. Somehow along the line, we, we didn't pay enough attention to the quantity particularly. Uh, and then thirdly, the public realm and uh, urban environmental improvement, which of course is probably the focus of much urban design thinking uh, and is particularly important to us. And then finally, the question of skills and resources and the whole structure and the way in which local government behaves uh, because that's critical to making progress in, in a planning sphere. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about. And then in the second half of the, of the presentation, I'll just be showing the evidence really, the city by city variations with a largely pictorial, the uh, principal failings, focus a bit on those, and if I have time, I'll just talk about how the Conservatives eviscerated the policies and what they put in their place. So it's quite a, a challenge to get all this done. And I begin with um, an interesting observation, really, on the, um, the criticisms of the urban renaissance, which came right in at the beginning. People like Patsy Healy said it was a sort of architectural um, preoccupation, architectural determinism. Um, Peter Hall said it was uh, European urban romanticism uh, a la Barcelona, and there was a lot of Barcelona in the original report. Um, even Ivan Turek at Glasgow said that, you know, the consumption-led revival that would predicate it, if really, the uh, task force on, uh, would, would not work. David Locke said, 
you know, where are the suburbs? Why aren't you talking about the suburbs? It's where every, all the families live. Um, Loretta Lee said it will be a gentrifier's charter. How right she was. Um, the question of social justice versus competitive individualism, uh, Ash Amin mentioned uh, as a major question really for the Renaissance. And finally, Alison Rivette put her two pennies worth in saying, I thought environmental quality was a result, uh, not a determinant of urban success. So all of those, I think, were really, really important criticisms that uh, were not, understandably, were not, not heeded. Um, because what happened was that the professionals, planning, architecture, urban design, local government, environmentalists, were just so pleased to have the new Labour government saying, look, this is a job for local authorities, and they've got to succeed, they've got to deliver. Um, so that sort of sets the background for uh, the, uh, a, a, a discussion of what the uh, urban renaissance is all about. I think its first and most important and probably its major achievement was that it provided a, um, co a comprehensive uh, national urban design framework for the first time, built within the planning system. And, um, a new plan-led system with very clear, um, relatively clear uh, prescriptions for what the uh, strategy should say. It should be a very strategic document, a very visionary document, shouldn't get bogged down too much in detail. But to, to supplement it, there should be a great deal of supplementary planning guidance, which uh, would be produced particularly by, by CABE. And CABE really is um, at the heart of the story because CABE replaced the very um, autocratic Royal Fine Art Commission, the very aristocratic uh, Royal Fine Art Commission. And CABE uh, built itself uh, an empire very, very quickly, from 20 staff to 120 in a matter of um, uh, about to, to 10 years, I would say. So that by 2009, it was uh, really, really strong. And one of the most interesting things about it was it was making urban design academics completely irrelevant because the uh, CABE could produce something in two or three months that was very substantive, very expert, right on the button, um, and it, we just couldn't compete with that. So it was a very a tremendous shot in the arm, really, to the, uh, the whole growth of, of urban design thinking. Um, we also had in the urban design framework um, a very strong low carbon green infrastructure um, agenda. The Code for Sustainable Homes was introduced as a kind of building regulation refinement updating, uh, and that certainly progressed uh, very quickly. And the placemaking agenda, um, the idea of corporate, corporate local government placemaking, uh, was very strongly in, enshrined with a strong public participation element. So, all of these things, I think were important. And then the more conventional things like the um, let's improve the efficiency of development control. You know, you hear that everywhere. Uh, it's always a key issue. Um, and uh, so that was inevitable. And one of, the, one of the problems right from the outset was that the new development plans were not really understood by, the, um, by local government. And that meant that the delivery of plans was very, very slow. With a plan-led system, if you don't have a plan, then you, don't, you can't implement any kind, other kinds of strategies, etc. So I think that was, uh, that was a critical, um, critical problem from, from the outset. Cade produced a great deal of work. Um, the, this is just a sample of, of, uh, of the new documents which now grace everybody's shelf. The um, by design was written essentially by the Conservatives. It took four years for them to produce it. Uh, and by the time they came to publish it, CABE had to edit it. So it's CABE edited, but not CABE written. But this is a testament that the Conservatives were thinking about quality at least, and urban design was becoming a buzzword for them. We had work on intensification of suburbia. We had a great deal of work on uh, the manual for streets, getting the highway engineers to talk to each other uh, and to talk particularly to planners and urban designers. We had um, work on the council, councillors and um, how to get design quality into development control. 
We had building for life criteria, which were part of um, what are the criteria by which we'll judge housing quality. Uh, that was very successful. And those sort of CABE fostered and government uh, fostered publications were paralleled by the profession looking at design policy, the urban design group looking at design guidance, and English partnerships um, and the housing corporation coming together, social housing and development facilitation, to do their compendium of urban design. So, you know, these are the books that students now read. Uh, and textbooks are, are in some senses out of the window, uh, and quite rightly so, because the, the quality and the speed at which these were produced uh, was really uh, remarkable. So we didn't get many plans. The plans we got sort of showed us that there were new things happening. Um, this is the Plymouth plan, which is a sort of city-wide, city uh, good analysis of context, very, very simple policies, um, but looking across the whole city. Ashford is one of the rare examples where you can find a um, new development plan which is very positive about growth. What you can see here are six or seven major new extensions to the town centre, uh, and that, was a very, that could be very effective. In Bristol, um, where the boundaries of the city are largely controlled by surrounding authorities, what we see is a neighbourhood intensification, neighbourhood centres programme, new transit lines trying to connect those with the city centre. And in Westminster, we have the kind of classic situation of virtually everything is a conservation area, except the royal parks, which of course are conservation anywhere. And then these small red areas, which are crossrail stations, railway stations, derelict sites, where a massive intensification of development can take place. But these are four of the kind of new generation of plans uh, which promised to be very effective, but really uh, didn't deliver in that way at all. What there was also happening at the same time was that cities were beginning to think about much more detailed design strategies and things to underpin the uh, development framework. So these are two good examples, Nottingham in particular, with what they call, they misleadingly call a city centre master plan, but a kind of clear idea of where major development was going to go in individual locations, which is very rare in a British discretionary system. And then somewhere like Bristol, which was picking up on the public realm and talking about the way in which they could pedestrianise large chunks of the city, um, get much more priority to public transport and confine the uh, cars to the outer edge of the city centre where there would be appropriate parking. So these were the sort of some of the new ideas that were being put forward. Now the problem was, as I say, the local development frameworks, only 12% had developed strategies five, by five years later. 63% today have, have, got have got frameworks, but they're not all approved. So the slow plan making process was very difficult. And it was part of the reflection that local authority leadership was very reluctant to prioritize planning and design. They were uh, very stuck in their existing uh, patterns of, of behavior. There was very little front-loading of consultation on the development frameworks, and the, the opposition which it, these generated within the, the wider community was very significant. Um, and it wasn't until 2008 that the, uh, the late new Labour government said we need to do something about public participation and to front load it uh, very clearly. So that was uh, a problem that was dealt with, but, but too late really for the system to really work. Um, the number of proactive plan-led policy-backed design regimes, uh, plan-led policy-backed policy design sensitive, was comparatively rare. I've shown you four previous examples. Otherwise, it tended to be those cities um, which had already established a reputation for urban design. So they were well equipped technically to do that. Um, but otherwise, what we found was uh, quite a skills deficit in control policy and enhancement that, that, uh, that uh, didn't allow the kind of corporate work working which the uh, task force had hoped. So, and the local planning authority planners often complain that there are too many CABE publications being produced. They couldn't keep up with them. They couldn't... Um, uh, 
they couldn't digest them and decide how to implement them. And there was anyway, at the same time, a hemorrhage of talent to the private sector, as there always is in a development boom. So with city, cities and districts were losing some of their most skilled people. So it was a very steep learning curve, really, towards higher densities, intensification, uh, improvement of the public realm. These are all, in a sense, new things that the local authorities were all now having uh, to deal with. So the impact of CABE locally was, I think, um, questionable. But because it didn't direct itself primarily towards uh, the local authorities, and the planning regime. But from most other points of view, the work of CABE was, was fantastic. Now, the second kind of um, key issue I need to address is housing supply, affordability, quality, and sustainability. Because this was really where the, the um, urban renaissance shot itself in the foot. Um, it began with a very good uh, relationship uh, between the um, homes, the formation of the Homes and Communities Agency, which put together the um, English partnerships, development facilitators, with the social housing providers. So there was a positive instrument for social inclusion and also for improved supply of housing. Um, very quickly, CABE got stuck into the quality of housing. And with their new Building for Life criteria, they began to measure uh, the quality of development. And they came to conclusions by midterm 2005-06 that most development was very mediocre. Very little was very good. And 29% was certainly poor. So the supply of housing and the quality of housing began to work against each other, really, in terms of you know, well, what do you want? Do you want us to build quickly? Do you want us to build uh, high quality? There was no doubt where, where Cave stood on that. Um, and indeed, most people were looking for an improvement in, in design quality. Um, so good residential design practices were certainly established. Design charrettes, master plans, codes, you know, pedestrian-dominated layouts, the kind of thing that I was studying in 2002 in, when I was in Western Australia, the Liverpool Neighbourhoods Programme. That kind of thing was, became a, a major part of uh, what, uh, w what we were implementing in the UK. The Code for Sustainable Homes was introduced, moving towards progressive zero carbon by 2016. But of course, not only were, they, was the, were the house builders being asked to improve the quality, they were now also being uh, asked to improve the sustainability, the energy efficiency of, of buildings. Um, so all of those things really were part of how the house builders um, began to think, well, you know, everyone's being very critical of us. Um, we're asked, being asked to produce more affordable and more expensive um, insulation, etc. So, um, you know, they weren't really playing ball uh, in the way in which had way, way which had been anticipated. So there was a very slow increase in, in supply. And it wasn't until 2008 that Gordon Brown woke up to that problem following the Barker report and said, look, we have to boost. We won't get re-elected unless we boost private supply and the, the supply of affordable housing. So that was something that was done very much at the last moment. If it had been done four years earlier, it might well have been different and critical, but it wasn't. So the boost to supply was very short-lived. And throughout the period, we never really reached the, growth, the rate of growth of household uh, consumption, which the task force had really wanted to, really focused on, said, we've got to deliver these 230,000 houses a year. So we did see some success with the level of affordable housing, which was delivered as part of planning gain. But it was quite clear that that 33% that was being delivered was also tending to drive density up and design quality down. And that was particularly evident in the massive high-rise apartments that were built, uh, which was half of all production, built around the edge of existing city centers uh, by 2007. And that became a kind of speculative bonanza for people to not to, um, to, to push up the price by using them for buy-to-let. So the rental market boomed short for a short period, 
but buying apartments became, uh, it kept the cost of apartments up when they should have been uh, being re significantly reduced. There were two big elements in terms of the public sector. A decent homes program of renewal on all the major public housing estates, which was very successful, but far less successful was the council estate regeneration program, which was a very slow process and with significant privatization of the best stock um, so that there was, th many of these schemes have only now started under a conservative regime and they will take the credit for, for that, I suppose. Um, but it will be interesting to see how those things pan out because the future is no, by no means certain. So here are the two graphs, really, which are really critical. And you can see that you know, our housing had been bubbling along at about 150,000. It dropped to, dropped to uh, 140. And then in the Renaissance, it began to increase. So that by um, 2008 here, it was getting up towards uh, two, over 200,000. So if we'd maintained that tra trajectory, we would have been uh, finally meeting our targets. But of course, it never happened. The crash in 2009 led, has led to a 50% reduction in production, so that has made the situation indisputably worse. And it's not Labour's fault, but what is Labour's fault really is not restoring um, a, a public housing programme uh, when it came into office, um, and its failure to, boot, to really boost the housing association supply, uh, the sort of third, third sector housing. Um, really has been a major problem. So that all the things that might have countered the inevitable gentrification of shortage of supply were never really implemented. And that's become a basic problem for uh, the, con in the contemporary era. So in the just looking at a couple of examples, Manchester, um, we've got good and bad really in terms of uh, lots of city centre housing uh, adjacent to hotels, but it very quickly... Uh, became instead of the kind of uh, the mixed use public space um, new lively city centre we get into very overdeveloped uh, projects where the communal space has disappeared where there's very little space between the um, uh, the rows of, of buildings uh, and then in the private sector in the in the uh, suburban sector we have a situ sorry we have a situation where um, we get more of the same, but the quality of uh, much of this housing uh, leaves a lot to be desired. The park hasn't been developed by the local authority. It looks like there's a missing community element here. Parking, the reduced parking standards, which have been part of compact development, um, and the inevitable neo-vernacular uh, housing design meant that many of these sorts of schemes were failing completely on the CABE scale. So house builders were being asked to do something completely different. Uh, and they stuck really to this kind of formula because this was where the, the incredible money, the, the very significant amounts of money were. So it was a very distinctive um, period really in terms of the pattern of development. Um, there were three other programs that were, signi that were significant or should have been significant. Um, as part of the attempt to divide to, to uh, drive uh, increased supply, we had a sustainable communities plan here, but as it turned out, was largely peripheral development um, on the edge of existing cities. And very quickly, critics were saying, this isn't sustainable. This is not uh, linked to, into the city centers, not part of the, uh, it's not, uh, hasn't got low energy. It has not got a high quantity of affordable. So. This was a, a program that was a uh, very strong failure. And then as part of balancing the books, the north of England had to have its housing market renewal areas in 2003. And these were similarly unsuccessful because the idea of renewing housing markets in areas of relatively declining population weren't going to work. Far more important and potentially useful was the Ecotown's proposal. But if, when this program was announced, these sites had not been through the local planning process. So they were sort of, the local community said, well, we're working on our local development framework. We haven't, uh, 
and within it is not a new eco-town. So there was furious opposition to the eco-town proposals, and they died a death. Um, and they're only gradually being re resurrected under different titles and different, um, different programs. Now, there were great successes. New Hall in Harlow, which was um, one of those within the Sustainable Communities Program, we have some very remarkable housing, largely because um, we have a very um, well-intentioned landowner who wanted quality, who recognized that the quality of the first piece of development would upgrade the returns on the second and third and fourth projects. It would set the standard, um, and so it proved. So we have an enlightened landowner, architectural competitions, master plan project, um, the master planner retained to vet the competition, etc., and very diverse products as a result of that. But this is very much the exception rather than the rule. In housing market renewal, we have the occasional um, urban splash project. This is Chimney Pot Place in, in Salford, where you, know, you have the kind of Coronation Street uh, facade, but uh, not chimneys, you have the uh, skylights to take light into, um, light into the center of the building. You have parking underneath at the back, and then you have the first floor of um, small gardens and the potential for quite a lot of social interaction. So there were good projects under housing market renewal, but there was also a lot of very unnecessary demolition and the quality of new, new build was really, really lacking. So that was, a, um, that, that was the part of the problem, really, uh, that we had to encounter. And then in estate regeneration, there were very much hallmark projects. But again, the, the problem here was that um, the regeneration contained a mix of retained properties, new private and social housing, uh, better school, um, and uh, extensive greening, as you can see, but the amount of affordable housing inevitably reduced so that um, you would still get uh, a, a significant component. But of course, what was 100% council housing maybe now is down to 35, 40%. So that was regarded as a gentrification program, uh, even though the new estates in some instances were uh, quite successful. So the critical weakness of of the second element, housing supply, was that it, um, there was inadequate supply, rapid price inflation, massive buy-to-let scandals, really. And um, the, the result was a strong critique of all the apartment developments uh, on design grounds and a strong social critique in terms of increasing gentrification, uh, etc. So there were very few low-carbon projects um, and what essentially happened was that as new supply decreased, um, the housing benefits bill increased so that the money that we would have put into building social housing has been reclaimed more and more by housing benefits bills. So this really difficult equity question uh, now confronts us. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, it, it was one of the great tragedies, really, of the uh, Renaissance movement. The third thing I wanted to talk about, th third key element, is this emphasis on quality public realm. Um, there were major improvements in, in the city centre public realms particularly. Perhaps they were concentrated inevitably in central cities where walking became a, a major priority. Um, there were great benefits in the manual for streets because it brought the um, 20 mile per hour zone in, the home zone idea, uh, calming of arterial, arterial roads, um, the city streetscape challenge in central London. There are a lot of major, um, major new projects where the highway engineers work closely with planning authorities. Um, the London congestion charge was a great success, a 30% reduction in traffic, funding the bus network, reclaiming a lot of, creating a lot of public space for reclamation. Uh, Boris Johnson cut back the western half of it, unfortunately, and Labour refused or Labour failed to back similar campaigns in Edinburgh and Manchester. So we still have this sole example, but it's a very, very important example uh, of the way to go, really. Um, the problem of 
public realm was extended into ideas of green space. Um, a lot of heritage lottery money was diverted so that our parks were improved greatly, but the general success in terms of neighborhoods was actually quite difficult to manage, quite difficult to show. Um, and when I found this statistic that poor, unsatisfactory neighborhoods, neighborhoods reduced from 68 to 53 percent over the first half of the Renaissance, um, it seemed to me that that was a kind of a, a pyrrhic victory, if you like. But I guess actually a 15 percent change in a, those seven years could be regarded as very significant. So those were the um, aims, if you like, of the public realm. And there were huge improvements um, of which things like uh, Trafalgar Square was a, a kind of high class example. The finishing of the Birmingham spaces and the pedestrianization of central Birmingham, the pedestrianization of much of central Newcastle, um, the uh, restoration of the Peace Gardens and the Winter Gardens here in Sheffield, uh, a very important uh, development giving civility to uh, what would otherwise be quite cold spaces for much of the year. Um, so that was, they were all very positive elements. But the ideas of the task force, that you would have a network of public spaces connecting out into the periphery and into the green belt, areas of sort of um, green wedges that would run along watercourses, that would have cycleways and pedestrian routes, running tracks, suburban public spaces, all of those sorts of things. There was no statutory duty for, for, social, for green space programs. So none of those were realized. In the city centers, yes. And there were significant um, increases in walking and cycling and some public transport revival. But we didn't get the kind of comprehensive public realm strategy that New Labour had dreamed of. And that really was a, a major setback. Labour also led to produce this uh, st extraordinary stati statistic that closed circuit television became the way in which we controlled crime budgets. Uh, not only, they, it was that policing was a secondary function. Much of the crime budget went on this kind of activity. And the ASBOs, the antisocial behavior orders for policing, didn't produce any kind of significant, uh, really significant improvement on more rundown estates. So there was low improvement in the areas which needed it most, but significant improvement elsewhere. But not always significant improvement. These are two rather graphic examples. This is Bristol, where the Legible City Initiative had, of course, a long way to go in terms of clearing up the clutter uh, of, uh, that bedevils much urban design. Um, and this was Banks's response to uh, the one nation politics of new labor in terms of uh, CCTV was the way in which extraordinary growth in CCTV was now a major, major phenomenon. And then finally, an aspect, another critical aspect linking planning to urban design is the question of resources and skills for local government and regeneration. Um, there was, uh, there was some improvement, whoops, go back. There was some improved uh, funding. Um, let's go back. Oops, backwards. Yes. There was some improved funding, but not enough really to significantly increase the quality uh, of development. And the new ideas we had about development taxation were very, took a very long time to resolve. Now we have a situation where planning gain only asks for affordable housing. The community infrastructure le levy asks for infrastructure and the possibility of tax increment financing allows you to get some money up front but those things have only recently been sorted so they were never part of the uh, of the key agenda to give local authorities more money to advance their cause um, that wasn't reformed the value-added tax which would have helped rehabilitation and conservation a lot of unnecessary de demolition for that for that reason and a lot of commitment to better leadership and design, in, in design, so that the chief planner's status was supposed to have been restored and increased, that city mayors might, uh, might take that on. But in fact, the, the opposition from within local authorities put paid to those reforms. Um, and a positive use of land disposal powers 
didn't increase because compulsory purchase orders were always very cumbersome and difficult. So these resources and skills for local government became, again, one of the, the kind of millstones of, for uh, the local authority uh, and for the Renaissance as, as a whole. So no financial improvements. Local authorities found themselves in a position of ratcheting up land values by giving more generous planning permissions, setting undesirable development precedents. Um, there was a hemorrhage of talent to the private sector I've mentioned before. The wider skills challenge of upgrading planners was uh, not really met. Um, there was a lot of retrenchment to statutory functions after 2010, and positive environmental enhancement never had statutory funding. Uh, funding. And so the house builders in this sort of position where, you know, they were, where they were being continually attacked for uh, the failure of, uh, of their um, quality of development, um, they were also trying to resist social rent, low carbon and community provisions as unaffordable. And they have been concentrating since the demise of, of a new labor on restoring their balance sheets uh, because given their land holdings um, and the problems of reductions in value. So really there has not been uh, an equivalent kind of um, resourcing to drive an urban renaissance forward. And that has been a big problem. There is everywhere you go in Britain examples of an urban renaissance. They're not hard to find. Um, this is kind of North London social housing, 40% you know, affordable. Um, communal children's play areas in the centre. Underground car parking, incredibly rare in Britain. Sheffield Peace Gardens, a great civic, a new civic venture to restore, knocking down the old planning department and uh, creating uh, a major public space. The Millennium Bridge, connecting the Tate Gallery to St Paul's Cathedral, leading to tremendous regeneration on the South Bank and new office areas on the South Bank. And then lowly barking in the middle of London's poorer eastern suburbs with a complete transformation of its city centre uh, with new public spaces, new affordable and private housing, uh, a great mix. So there are plenty of examples but they're very much one-offs, really, in the, in the scheme of things. So we see a very differential urban renaissance with very spatial, varied spatial impacts within the cities. Uh, the city centres, a tremendous improvement. Uh, consumerist emphasis, yes, lots of new retail, but dramatic improvements in the public realm and dramatic repopulation to drive new businesses. A new dense apartment complex, complexes which help the population increase but don't produce uh, decent neighborhoods really. They're very much isolated and where they touch the ground is deeply problematic. Um, good progress on, in on the decent homes but not on inner estate regeneration, much slower. So we get extensive gentrification, extensive studentification and the buy to let um, element produces an increase in private rental. So um, instead of an increase in, 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 home on, in the home ownership pattern. And all of that, I think, is, uh, sounds a death knell, really. And it provide, helps me to provide a big city typology uh, of design commitment, which I'll go into in a moment. The last thing I will say is that one of the critical elements, and perhaps one of the areas which relates most to what's going on in Sydney, is the need for, sim for suburban intensification was um, very param was paramount in the early days of the urban renaissance. Uh, and certainly it reduced the amount of edge city development, but the, the NIMBY response, because suburban intensification wasn't written into to a not large number of new development plans, uh, the NIMBYs responded with a very, very strong um, uh, reaction against suburban intensification. And it, not so much NIMBY, uh, you understand what NIMBY is, not in my backyard, more bananas build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone, uh, I think is probably a better, um, uh, a, a better uh, statement really of, of the nature of, of the beast. So I, a four point typology, um, which won't come as any surprise to you, because in some senses it reflects historic patterns. But 
those that have managed to be strong, consistent design control, actively shaping development, then I think there are probably there are three I'm going to talk about very briefly. City of West, the City of Westminster, um, let's go back. City of Westminster, London Borough of Camden, um, and Nottingham. Nottingham was the great surprise, so much so that when we had the presentations, we thought it was a whitewash. We had to go back and reinvestigate it to discover no, Nottingham had was the most ordinary place which had made the most considerable advances in the quality of, of design. So the London Borough of Camden, we had excellent projects like King's Cross, which um, does have a good affordable housing component, has um, the canal restoration, has a new uh, educational complex in the middle, new arts complexes as well. It's an argent development, so the, new de the developer is an imp important part of that. New Square by Land Securities, also in Camden, was a very good piece of public realm um, on public, the publicization of the private realm. So this is essentially private space, but um, given complete public access. We had very widespread creation of shared space, removing traffic from areas like the northern areas of Covent Garden, um, but elsewhere we would have very intense uh, patterns of development, as here um, in the St. Giles Lorenzo Piano Project in St. Giles at the back of um, uh, just the northern edge of Covent Garden, or here at Paddington Station and Paddington Basin along the canal, very intense patterns of development. Um, this is the Trellick Tower, some of you will be familiar with it. Um, this, because it was largely privatised council estate, wasn't something they could clear. So we've been kept, we have, we're going to retain some of these great monuments of the, port, of the past, really, uh, as being uh, very significant elements in the social housing program. Nottingham, as I said, was probably the, the, the best example we had of a place which had taken on board the Renaissance, you know, and really delivered on it. And partly that's because it had money for things like, it was given money for trams, and street improvements, the invisibility of the kind of tram infrastructure, I think, was a very great achievement. New City Square, uh, major conservation program, widespread pedestrianisation, improvement of the canal, new business districts on either sides of the city, the waterfront. And Nottingham achieved that because of its, the stability of its leadership, that it was already corporate. It had a clearly integrated strategy. It made design a priority and it brought to in the developers and the architects into that program. And CABE really put their weight behind Nottingham in a very, very positive way. So it's one of the shining examples, really, of that period. Much more common, really, is a sophisticated design controls, but being broken by entrepreneurial behavior, particularly by developers um, who were able to negotiate, or architects, really, able to negotiate exceptions. Manchester, Ian Simpson's uh, famous tower here, put paid to its world heritage status. Um, so the great icon of, uh, of the urban renaissance um, meant that the city didn't have that historic uh, designation that it really deserved by virtue of its well-restored Victorian architecture and its wonderful work it's done on restoring its canals and railway architecture as well. Um, I've already mentioned its apartments, its retail was re re rebuilt uh, following an IRA bomb. Uh, the new development was very sympathetic. In the, sub in the new suburban areas, there was a great emphasis on new architecture. Urban Splash again, um, Alsop's architecture, this is Chips in New Islington, um, bringing some very innovative thinking. Uh, but overall, a picture that's somewhat erratic uh, in terms of uh, wholesale improvement. Um, the City of London, well, the City of London, of course, is a century a corporation, a corporation, the City of London, so it is a complete uh, anomaly, really. Uh, it is, it's the kind of shining example, I suppose, of very good conservation, it's a Spitalfields, but also very heavy intensification in, in the commercial world. These are the low-rise Broadgate Towers. This was a particular good project which had this good edge to it, and it kept the market. Um, this is more typical of the kind of corporate space, 
that you get in, uh, in, in lieu of public space. But the City of London was obsessed with the new towers and new iconic buildings. Partly, of course, because it was competing with Canary Wharf. Um, partly because uh, there were always these small holes in the high tall buildings policy which allowed somebody, uh, some ambitious developer, um, to make a name for him or herself uh, in terms of the Heron Corporation here, uh, sorry, level 42, this one, um, and this is uh, Richard, uh, James Sellers building, uh, which is, you know, this is where Renzo Piano, all the kind of finesse that you, you associate in Sydney with Renzo Piano disappeared in a, a tower, glazed tower. So um, some, some interesting, of course, this is, this is Southwark, um, this is not part of the City of London, but the City of London, uh, on the ground it's good, uh, in the air, of course, it can well be uh, something uh, quite different. And, of course, one has to remember that Canary Wharf was there as always as a competition. Canary Wharf is not part of the urban renaissance, but it is key because it introduced American master planning to, to England. Uh, and, and was a very positive addition in that sense. It also made legitimized design guidelines, proper design guidelines. And it's a rather, the, the good side of this is that although we, we are confronted today with the kind of, you know, mini Manhattan environment, and an environment which is um, totally controlled, you can't smoke in public spaces in, because uh, they're not public, in um, anywhere in Docklands, which most of us think, of course, is a good thing but it's an indication of the level of control. But what happens when you go into Docklands on a Saturday and Sunday is that the shopping mall, which is under, underneath us here, is entirely, entirely full of young people uh, of a multi-ethnic dimension. So that the public spaces of Canary Wharf become intensively used on a, um, on a Saturday and Sunday by a completely different audience from that which is... Um, which normally occupies the suits, as I would call it, um, on the, at lunchtime and the evenings. So that's a kind of side swipe, really, at, um, at Canary Wharf. Um, but it is, in, in its own way, is quite an exemplar of, uh, of urban development um, and is something which has influenced the Renaissance movement. The London Borough of Southwark, um, it's a much poorer borough, uh, and it has been very entrepreneurial because it is interested, first of all, in getting rid of its major um, hardcore uh, estates of the period. This is a Lend-Lease project where 2,000 housing units is, are going to disappear. The population has already been decanted, decanted. Uh, Edinburgh, uh, the uh, uh, Elephant Castle development, which is a, a terrible eyesore. Um, so these are the sorts of really difficult projects they have to deal with it but they have been they have achieved some amazing um, planning gains in terms of affordable housing this is a 40 percent affordable in a uh, project which is open to pedestrian use the interior during the day but closes at night so this, these sorts of urban design projects have been quite inspirational less inspirational has been the um, what is laughingly called here the foster testicle the, um, the shard, so to speak, the great shard and London Bridge Station. Um, but again, it's very much a question of um, getting planning gain out of this that they can then lever into the improvement of hospitals, the creation of, of public housing. So I think places like Southwark have little choice um, to achieve things. Other cities, Liverpool and Sheffield, Newcastle, I'll just talk briefly about Liverpool and Sheffield, because they um, uh, are very significant. Liverpool is treading a tightrope, really, in terms of its potential loss of world heritage status. Uh, after the uh, fourth grace here, this is the attempt to match the Liver building and the, um, uh, the Pierhead buildings, the three great buildings, which are really the icons of Liverpool, with a fourth um, quality of public realm, a canal, a narrowboat canal cut through to link the system into uh, the uh, most uh, prestigious parts of the city. A, a real mess, really. And then North Liverpool, which is uh, Peel Holdings' project for massive growth, 
that one would welcome in many cities, but in, in Liverpool is just the one city which has a very minor, very, very low growth rate. So one wonders what, uh, what will be achieved in a project like this, which we, is referred to as Shanghai on Sea by all critics. On the other hand, Liverpool has redeveloped its shopping centre in a really uh, a first-class project. Uh, this is Grosvenor Estates, which is, many of you will know is the Duke of Westminster, so it's sort of ducal money, but they put nearly a, a billion pounds into the new shopping centre and they have linked all the streets up into uh, the, the, the pedestrian network. So it is now a fully permeable, no, no mile project. Um, and although you have shopping on three levels here, it's open to the elements. There's a new park over the multi-story. Um, it's essentially a private realm, but it is public to all intents and purposes. The only catch is that it's, uh, it's uh, patrolled by what are called sheriffs to main maintain that uh, quality and that control. So, um, a very, a real model project, 23 different um, it building projects by 16 different architects. It's a really interesting uh, exemplar, I think, of uh, what could be done. And then Sheffield, um, the quotation that was used here was from Nicholas Pevsner, who described going to Sheffield in the 1950s and saying it was a miserable disappointment. But Sheffield is one of those places with the most to achieve, really. And it is concentrated on a very strong public realm strategy of three routes which cross the city uh, mm -hmm. and use those to, to build new spaces, um, new, new facilities, uh, and to create uh, both a green network and a pedestrian network that can link university to city centre. Uh, a very successful project. And it has its share of new architecture, um, and it has another great urban splash project, which is this one, which is the old Park Hill Estate, which had been again emptied, but is this time to be restored as a mix of private and housing association projects. So a great example of a conservation project that uh, has been adaptable and allowed um, the new and old to, to mix together. And one which is relatively balanced in terms of its uh, personnel. More problematic, places like Birmingham, Leeds and Bristol, they had very good reputations for planning and urban design. They, I think, are suffering somewhat in the, uh, they suffered in the Renaissance era by failing to move on and to improve. Uh, Birmingham in particular uh, lost its way. It had a wonderful urban design section and planning uh, ethos in the uh, 19, 19, early 1990s, but it lost it in terms of essentially overdevelopment around the canals. Um, the flat thrash of the, the cold rash of tall buildings, um, which interrupted the um, or what was already broken skyscape, and big buildings like this, which is a kind of this is Selfridges, um, which my students describe as a Poco Roban Poco Raban uh, disco top, uh, and I think it's quite expressive of that in many ways. Um, one per perhaps a very interesting architectural statement but as a piece of urban design, it simply turns its back on uh, all, all edges of this, all parts of the, of the public realm. So that was a, something of an own goal. Leeds did it with very poor control of its, uh, uh, of its apartments. It had probably more ha apartments per capita than anywhere else, um, but it simply lost its ability to control uh, the communal space and the relationship with the street so, uh, and also any kind of um, attempt to make, uh, to create, to, to respect, if you like, the, the brick traditions of, of Leeds, which was very strong until uh, the 1990s. Uh, along the canals, you had a certain amount of uh, more modest attempts, but elsewhere, um, and particularly in the university, um, some very uh, problematic high-rise buildings. The high-rise buildings policy was an ex post facto thing and it had no r real rationale to it. Um, and then the, th the third example um, of Bristol. Um, Bristol, too cautious really, perhaps too conservationist, um, certainly 
a, a public um, opposition to virtually everything. Um, and also no money because it was essentially a prosperous city. So when it got to the situation of finally saying we're going to have some new retail um, and the, with, the, with the recession looming, they, they, vote, they voted for this project, which is the worst kind of suburban multi-level shopping centre plonked down in the, uh, on the eastern edge of the city centre and it does not achieve what it, what it should have achieved. So that was a very sad uh, event, really, for a, a, very, um, a, a very progressive, what was trying to be a very progressive city. It does, however, have the first architect mayor who was, who was elected last, uh, last Friday. Um, so we expect great things of him as, in terms of putting back the ethos of good design. He's already achieved it in his uh, little projects around the city. How do we explain that variability? Well, I've given you some explanations for that, but I think the broader explanations are that you know city boundaries are not consistent. Some cities are very different socioeconomically. Manchester is just a very small strip, um, so it doesn't have to worry about social housing, for example. Um, the, the spread of prosperity and disadvantage is very uneven. Also, inconsistent um, quality political leadership. It's absolutely critical to have that, to create stability. But many cities didn't have that. The planning committee versus officer relationship could be very difficult and often was. Um, the executive on the council often didn't pay much attention to the planning committee. They would simply approve things in house and then the committee would have to rubber stamp that decision. So these were big issues. And the issues of the estates and economic issues for the city against strong planning, you know, get more floor space, get more development, those were the overriding factors. So all of those, I think, were, were significant problems. Um, the local development industry, in places like Liverpool and Manchester, they were superb. Small-scale projects, Urban Splash, Igloo, uh, for example, was a very sustainable developer. Um, those, in certain places, the local, and George Ferguson in Bristol, this local development industry doing small-scale conservation type, but increasingly large projects were innovative and were really important actors uh, following the Cade mantra. Um, and the public awareness and support uh, for design, was that really tapped? Well, it was tapped, but what we found was that uh, the more public awareness about quality of design, the greater the public opposition. So that uh, that was a, a difficult issue to follow. And then the, the whole spread of funding was interesting. London got more than a, the lion's share with the on, oncoming Olympics, especially after 2007 when Boris Johnson took over um, and uh, central local political relationships uh, were somewhat changed. So... Um, that's another, that's another factor, really. London is the exception to everything else in, in Britain, uh, and uh, it, it's particularly, particularly significant. So when we talk about design-led renaissance, what do we, what do we have to say? Um, I have to say in the first instance, which I should have probably put a slide on, these were the great successes. You know, some of the city's examples we've used uh, the pedestrianisation of city centres, the upgrading, um, the innovation of, of many development projects and conservation projects, all of those. But it was such a disappointment to those of us who are urban design fanatics, if you like, or academics, that I think I have to focus on what went wrong because it didn't achieve what, it, what we hoped it would achieve. The reasons for this were some of the failings of, of new labour itself. It's it had what we call initiative, initiative-itis. You know, there are new initi initiatives every year, sometimes two new initiatives. And while they were trying to correct certain failures of things, then, it, you know, it was not helping uh, the, the, the overall confusion. Maybe what New Labour needed was um, a scaled-down project because the project they invented was a 30-year project. They should have thought through making enough gains to ensure re-election uh, when it came in, in uh, 2010. So 
the micromanagement tendency didn't help, and local planning authorities were overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Then, of course, the neoliberal policies uh, to reduce the role of the state in housing uh, and social welfare kicked in as well, so that new labour was never going to be allowed, really, to start rebuilding uh, a council housing programme. A social welfare programme was cut. Um, everything was hived off to private finance initiatives. So it, was, it, was, it looked like the public books were being balanced. And that was a terrible move in terms of the quality of development. Uh, housing supply shortages, especially for poorer families, meant that gentrification was inevitable. Loretta Lee said it always would be, but it wouldn't, didn't need to be. Uh, it negated the social mix aspiration, which was re very, very strong in the, um, in the Renaissance agenda. The plan-led system was slow to be established, and then when plans did start to talk about suburban intensification, there was a very strong reaction against it. So um, that was sort of that was part of the, the politics of the situation. Land prices escalated hugely, partly as a result of globalization, uh, but also because of potential profitability of development, which was uh, very significant. And local, uh, local authority leaders didn't take the long-term view uh, of new labor at, la at large. So they were, um, they were very short-termist in terms of quantities of development and were not particularly interested in, in raising the quality. The city centres, as I said, were favoured. The consumerist focus was something that worried Ivan Turek. Uh, that certainly came to pass. Uh, and what followed in its wake was a huge amount of hotel, retail, um, entertainment, tourist investment. So that the uh, iconic building and the, um, the, the, th the drive for development really took over. Local authorities were not um, organised or resourced to, to be placemakers. Um, it was much more difficult than we thought to get planners to work with highway engineers, to work with, um, to work with new design guidance, etc. Uh, the value of urban design campaign, which was a central feature of the K program, persuaded only a minority of developers and politicians that quality would pay for itself. Uh, and I think that's, that was a, a, a terrible disappointment, really. Urban Splash and people like that made a, uh, have made it, clearly made it work, but others were reluctant to go down the quality route. The speculative development industry continues to lack the quality aspiration. It's the custom niche built, rare but inspirational project that, that takes all the laurels really for development. London, as I've said, well, London is the exception because it's central urban renaissance is staggering, really. It's monopoly of finance and investment. It's the only place today where you'll see any office development. It's a complete exception. It's part of that primate city uh, element. It's a kind of neoliberal inevitability about it. But the house pri pricing of people out of London uh, is dramatic. And the confusion of placemaking pl and place marketing, which I've already alluded to, um, I think was uh, also a major issue. The icons, the consumer spaces, the urban competitiveness agenda were always working against widespread uh, regeneration with significant uh, potential for improvement uh, in terms of social mix. So those were the, uh, the key aspects. What has happened since has really simply put the nail in the coffin of um, the uh, urban design renaissance because the recessionary politics um, and the neoliberal and the neoliberal uh, pre-existing neoliberal element have meant that the, the, the design focus has been eclipsed by uh, a housing supply crisis, which is now very dramatic. If there were any demand, if people get, could get mortgages, there would be a huge outcry, but they, people cannot get mortgages. So uh, the, the production of housing has dropped remarkably by 50% from a relatively you know, a, a level which was already well below the required replacement rate. Uh, the state will have to underpin affordable housing provision, but the way that conservatives are going is they've cut the housing benefits and the pr uh, private, 
private rental supply has been given priority. They're in fact, they're moving people out of central London because they uh, don't want to pay the prices that the private rental market uh, insists upon. Um, the house builders have largely ceased production. Uh, they're waiting to rebuild their profit margins. Um, and what is happening is that all those planning permissions which have previously been negotiated with affordable housing, with community benefits, are being renegotiated and they're being halved or even further reduced. So it's a very difficult issue. But I just point to this, issue, this point here. Look what happened to land prices during the urban renaissance. This is what happened to house prices. Land prices went berserk. Something very different was happening. And partly that's driven by intensification, but I think it's also driven by globalization. So very difficult situation, and there's going to have to be a major reduction in land values, some of which you can see taking place. Design quality is still strongly supported by the Tories because it says, you know, good design is indivisible from good planning. It still says that in the planning documents. And the, the Tories have moved to really support the plan-led system. And I give them credit for that because I think that really important. Um, they've offered housing incentives to local authorities, but they have also opened the localism contradiction. So there is a new breed of localism, which is going to be a nightmare when it comes to suburban intensification. CABE has had its budget cut by 82%. So it is but a shadow of its former self now. Only the design review function is left. Um, and that's, I think, it was a major part of where it began, but it wasn't a major part of where it finished up. Uh, so that was a really uh, bad. And then another uh, key agency, Design for London, that's had a budget cost of 62%. So it was doing a lot with transport and urban design. The anti-planning rhetoric has increased. Um, the positive action on poor performing authorities is going to take place. They'll be penalised. Um, garden cities are promised instead of eco cities to keep Rob Freestone very happy, no doubt. But, um, you know, to see a return like that. Um, the Building for Life audits, which were telling us the quality was problematic, have now been eviscerated. So there's only 12 criteria now, and good sustainability is gone. Um, all of those things have, have taken place. And the, is there any local pressure for design quality? Well, it, when it comes down to trying to deliver it, it's really the design quality remains dependent on the client commitment outside of London. And CLG's grant, which rose very, very high by 2008, has now dropped by 74%. So we're back really to conservative figures, uh, as you might express, expect. So that's a pretty sad story. And I have to finish on at least one bright note um, by saying that the Olympics kind of proved to us that urban design could work. Uh, and I think it proved to the public that it could work on a, on a very, uh, very dramatic level. Uh, but of course, for those of us in the know, we know that uh, this is Lend-Lease um, and uh, you know, where you have apartments with active uses, it's going to be 40% affordable uh, by the end of the day. Westfield is at the heart of the, um, uh, of the Stratford project and also that, you know, the master planning, uh, Bly McNeil um, master planning of the thing was also done by Australians. So there's a big boost to Australian urban design. The question for, for uh, the UK is what will be the Olympic le legacy? Will it withstand the cuts? Will this, what was promised to be, something to drive the regeneration of East London. Will that really take place? So that is an, that's an open question, really, uh, against, uh, against which we will uh, draw verdicts on the English urban renaissance. Thank you very much for your patience.